Socialism, is it compatible with Christianity? The usual kind of concept goes something like this when you have particularly arguments or discussions with young people people kind of think oh well you know we've never really tried the real thing so let's just give it another try and people live in some form of denial of the history and yes there is some degree of truth that when you look at the real if you like the philosophical arguments of socialism and you then compare it to some of the historical situations that have occurred, they don't entirely line up, but we'll touch on that later. Let's just look at what it means to compare socialism with Christianity. So first up, I think it's important to understand that we're not talking about communism here. Communism is a dreaded word, and today the more popular term is democratic socialism. Somehow people seem to think that this changes the basic idea behind socialism. It's a kind of soft, modern version, and it's hip, and, you know, people think, oh, there's, it's not really communism, we're talking about something totally different. If we, if we only elect leaders that roll out socialist ideals, then we essentially have a democratic version, which is not communism. And of course, when people think of the historical versions of it, they think of communism, and that's somehow how people get away from that idea. Karl Marx, the most prominent philosopher behind the ideals of socialism, believed that it was a transitional stage between capitalism on the one side and social communism on the other. Marx essentially believed that the world is in an automatic state of development and it will inevitably move towards communism at some point. This is like a de facto thing. We, we can't do anything about it. This is exactly what's going to occur. He called this the dialectic method. Few people who desire some form of socialism really understand all the concepts. And there are, of course, also a great many variations of opinion in that whole thing. In this little presentation, I'm going to discount all the variations and the Marxian dialectic. I'm not saying we should. I'm just saying it's for the purpose of this little comparison between socialism and Christianity. So I'm going to discount the Marxian dialectic and I'm going to discount all the variations. I'm just going to look at the basic concept. So I'm going to look at just the root or the definition and compare it. Is it compatible? Very few Christians who believe in the socialist ideas would agree with the Marxian dialectic. And that's probably why I'm going to discount it. So let's just assume for the sake of brevity and simplicity that one can have a form of socialism without all the Marxian ideology, ideology attached to it. Let's therefore, first of all, arrive at a basic definition of the term. So I, I've looked at a range of different definitions. Um, and, you know, you can you can look up on the Internet, you can go and do an Internet search and look at some of the major major dictionaries of the, the English language to, to, to see what the definition of the term is. And I think you'll find that they are all fairly similar. And the shortest one I could come up with that sort of pulls back all the, the, the fluff from it, if you like, is that the means of production are owned and controlled by the state. And I think all real social socialist forms of government have that in common. So there's a brief definition of socialism derived from a few well-known dictionary websites. And by all means, do your own research. So it's a system or condition of society in which the means of production are owned and controlled by the state with the purpose of equal distribution according to need. And I, I think it's actually quite helpful at this point to 
just look at a brief definition of capitalism. I'm not comparing capitalism with Christianity, nor am I saying that socialism and cap capitalism are the only two forms of kind of government or, or society organization. So it, I'm, I'm by no means now using capitalism as an argument, but I just, because most people do, I want to just put a, a definition out there just so that we clearly understand the difference. So it's helpful for the purpose of just juxtaposing it, a version of a term of capitalism, and it comes from the same um, if you like, dictionary um, sources. So capitalism as a system or condition of society in which the means of production are privately owned and controlled with the purpose of making a profit. Now, here's what I think most people believe, and because most people are not necessarily philosophically inclined or not don't fully understand the history, probably have never read of any of Marx's works and Engels and all the other people who, who if that you like, they look to. So I think that the general idea here is that most people think socialism is about this. It's like Robin Hood takes from the rich and gives to the poor. And when you think about it like that, of course, it sounds good. It sounds, you know, it sounds benevolent. It sounds kind. It sounds like the right thing to do. And for a young person who looks at all the ills in society, you know, why not? So this is in my personal conversations with people on this topic, the term in their minds often just means some kind of modern version of Robin Hood. You take from the rich, especially the super rich, and you give to the poor. And whilst Let's be really honest here. This is a gross oversimplification of the idea. I think it's okay to run with it for the moment because it will make it easier to understand. So what does the idea of taking from the rich entail? And this is the crucial bit that does that fit the notion or the worldview or the concept of Christianity, if you like. So number one, it assumes that taking from the rich is actually justified. In postmodern Christian views, people almost always have discarded the Old Testament with its legal demands on the church and the believer. Traditional forms of Christian belief, such as Reformed and Lutheran theology, do not do this. And given that I am reformed in my Christian belief system, I am going to go with the working assumption that at least the moral law in the Old Testament has binding power on the conscience of the believer. And the basic, most basic form of the moral law of the Old Testament are the Ten Commandments. The Eighth Commandment says, you shall not steal. You can find the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. It's really simple. And it doesn't leave any wiggle room to say it's okay in certain circumstances. The simple point here is, I cannot enter my neighbor's house. Let's say my neighbor has a TV in every bedroom and he has four bedrooms. I can't enter my neighbor's house and steal one of his TVs and take it down the road to the person who's poor, who doesn't have a TV at all. I don't know a single Christian who would deem such behavior to be okay. It's plain and simple to see that this is stealing. Essentially, what the state does is take from you and give to somebody else. If you think about it quietly, the state takes from one person, from a group of people, well, actually, it takes from everybody, but it takes from people to varying different degrees. It takes from some and gives to others. The motives behind the state taking and giving to the poor might be benevolent. I'm not questioning that at this moment. But it is also undeniable that my motive behind taking the TV from my neighbor and giving it to the poor person could just as well be benevolent. The issue here is not one of motive. 
The issue here is one of principle. The advocate of socialism has to deal with the problem of theft by the state. I have so far never heard a reasonable argument that sufficiently deals with this problem in relation to the biblical command, you shall not steal. Some people say, ah, oh, but there's this thing called the social contract. And they come up with all these elaborate arguments of why we have contracted the government in a way to say we, we've agreed to it and therefore they can take my money at the end of every month or at the end of every year, depending on which country does it when. The social contract argument aims to get around this problem by saying that all members of the country run by, let's say, the socialist state, but really any modern state, that all members of the country run by the socialist state agree with the state's actions through this unwritten contract. I would suggest, though, that this fails to deal with the problem at a very foundational level. No one ever agrees to this contract. If I have a contract that I want to buy a house, what do I do? I, dis I discuss with the person who's selling the house and with my bank and with all the parties to that contract. I come to an agreement and we enter into the contract. No one has ever agreed to the, so the so-called unwritten social contract that is used as the argument to say the state has the right to do what I as a person do not have the right to do. No one ever agrees to this contract in the way all normal contracts are handled. Contracts re require discussion and agreement prior to accepting the contract and the acceptance, very importantly, is voluntary. None of the st standard contract ideas fit the social contract concept. And hence, it is a fallacy to use it as an argument with the problem of the state stealing. Number two, this idea, remember we're talking about Robin Hood takes from the rich, gives to the poor as being put forward as the argument that socialism is the perfectly valid concept. The rich are collectively guilty of taking from the poor. This is a failed argument. I'm not suggesting that there aren't rich people who have fraudulently taken from the poor, but it is, it is, it is wrong to say that all wealthy people have done so. That is patently false. So secondly, the Robin Hood idea assumes that the rich are collectively guilty of stealing from the poor. No doubt some rich people or corporations do steal and do deal fraudulently and have thereby achieved an unfair advantage in the marketplace. Nonetheless, it is logically flawed to state that because some people are guilty of fraud, all are. This is as flawed as saying that some married, because some married men beat their wives, all married men do so, and hence we should reject the concept of marriage altogether. That is patently nonsense. The simple answer to this problem is not the collective stealing by the state of all the rich, but rather the eradication of fraud. In this discussion, we're dealing with the question of compatibility between socialism and Christianity. Not with the argument of between socialism and capitalism, that's a totally separate argument. All human forms of economic activity are inherently flawed, since all humans are flawed by the very sin nature they are subject to. Remember, we're dealing with Christianity here. When arguing for or against a particular economic solution to societal issues, the Christian should firstly look to scripture and see which system directly violates biblical commands by first causes. Thirdly, this idea assumes that there's a built-in assumption that the poor are always innocent. This is by no means the case. 
Yes, much of our societal poverty is circumstantial, and as a Christian, one should be concerned about justice and helping the poor. This is not the argument in this situation here. Of course that is true. But that does not therefore lead to the assumption that is made when we're talking about socialism. The Bible strongly advocates the individual believer to be generous and kind to the poor and give from his abundance, as in the wealthy believer. There is, however, no injunction in the Bible and particularly no justification for a kind of government such as a socialist kind and to elevate this government to a position of the sole distributor of justice or financial justice in that sense. Many Christians make the mistake that Paul's call to submit to the magistrate in Romans 13 is an endorsement of the concept of the state. This has to be imposed on the text. Paul speaks of the magistrate who is set to punish evil and reward good. It is perfectly feasible to view the magistrate as a person who would exist outside of a monopolistic kind of government the way we have it right now. But rather, let's look at a totally free form of government, a decentralized form of government where there is no federal, no state government. Let's see that talking about Australia here where the government exists in each council. And if I don't like the government in my council, I simply move to another council and have a totally different government. There would, of course, quite likely be arbiters of all the contractual agreements that exist in such a decentralized situation. Those arbiters would perfectly fit well with the concept of the magistrate that Paul talks of in Romans 13. The Roman magistrate in Romans 13 would fit this role of arbiter quite well. Hence, one must be very careful to read into this passage what is plainly not there. Deuteronomy tells us there will never cease to be poor in the land, giving us a strong indication that this issue will not be resolved in human history. Most believers think that when Christ returns to inaugurate the new heavens and the new earth, all issues relating to sin will be eradicated. There are numerous calls to be generous and kind to the poor in Scripture, but not one of these are a call for a monopolistic state to act as the single redistributor of wealth. The Christian call to look after the poor is not compatible with a socialist call to give the state a monopoly of redistributive power. The book of law of the Old Testament tells us we should not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. In other words, each situation should be judged on its own merit. The blanket redistribution of wealth as Marx termed it, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Sounds good on the surface, but who determines who has ability and who determines who has need? If I, as an individual, make a mistake by giving to the wrong person, who defrauded me by deceiving me? Only two parties are involved. If the state errs, vast numbers of people are involved. Socialist redistribution of wealth is both wrong at the fundamental level, because it is theft, but it is also wrong at the pragmatic level, because it can be absolutely catastrophic. And honestly, I think it is an unavoidable reading of history that this is precisely what happens. Finally, we have the issue of coercion. Whilst some may voluntarily agree to allow the state to redistribute, what do we do with those who do not agree? There the answer is found in the singular monopoly of coercion that the state ends with. In reality, 
all forms of statism rely on the fact that the state has to be given powers and rights that no individual could morally be allowed to have. How is it that the socialist readily agrees that theft is morally wrong at the individual level, but readily agrees that the state can do what the individual would end up in jail for? Logic demands that if something is morally wrong for an individual, it must be morally wrong for a group. Since a group consists of individuals. To simply say the coercive powers of the state are nothing but a myth. And I mean a myth that they are legitimate. Of course, the, co the state has coercive power. That's not in question. The question of are they legitimate? And I think that is a myth. History demands that we reject socialism, from a Christian perspective, most certainly. Young people say today that those who argue against socialism from history, as I mentioned earlier, people like Lenin, Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot, are wrong because the historic examples of socialism were not true examples of it. And hence, they say, we've never really tried it. We don't have a real example to look to. Is this really true? Yes, on the one hand, there, this argument has some merit. Those examples were not the true form of socialism. The hard question is why? Humbly said, I think the whole concept of socialism is flawed as we just looked at a few simple examples. It is contrary to human nature and hence the only way it can be affected in society is by force. And in that sense, the examples that we have are actually true examples of the only kind of socialism we will ever see in human history. States and advocates of statism, the idea that a state is needed for human flourishing and that it is a necessary evil that Christians too must accept, have to accept that in order for any kind of socialism to exist, it must be imposed by force. On all the citizens in the state, and those who want it as well as those who do not. The long shot of socialism, therefore, is that it corrodes society, it destroys human flourishing, and the majority who wanted it will eventually come to hate it. Now, this is where it is important to not be narrow-minded and to look at the last hundred years of history and to see that what large volumes of people embraced it when they didn't know what it was they were embracing. But it did not take that long for people to realize how deadly it was and how long and how hard did people have to fight to free themselves from the clutches of it. The long shot of socialism is that it corrodes society and destroys human flourishing. The majority who wanted it will eventually come to hate it. State censorship grows at an equal growth rate of the dissidents in the state system. The trajectory of socialism is always some form of an authoritarian, totalitarian state where liberties are destroyed. The Christian religion, in my humble estimation, is diametrically opposed to tyranny. And socialism cannot exist without some form of tyranny. Tyranny is required to roll out socialism. That much we should have learned from history. Why are we hell-bent on repeating the worst lessons of history? Some final thoughts. These are just thoughts from, from a Christian evangelical perspective. Consistency, logic come into it. Traditional evangelicals would readily argue 
against all forms of coerced tithing practiced in many prosperity gospel oriented churches. Lots of churches practice tithing. Now, while it's true that, that many churches don't physically force their members to tithe, tithing, by the way, is a concept of you give one-tenth of your income to the church each month. All of the churches who do it use some form, and of course this happens on a spectrum, so there's a varying degree of coercion going on. All forms, so while they don't physically force their members, they do use all sorts of coercive tactics, such as browbeating, twisting scripture, making the non-tither feel uncomfortable at best. Tithing is biblical, in that it is in the Old Testament, and it was a Old Testament practice. That much, I think, is clear to anyone who reads the Old Testament. But it is not a valid New Testament idea, and there are good reasons for why not, and these are actually fairly simple to demonstrate. This session here is not the, the place that we're going to do that. The point I'm making here is one of consistency. If the church embraced embrace these ideas like socialism, they have no apologetic to say that malpractice such as tithing is wrong. Because if it is right for the state, which is just a group of humans controlling another group of humans, how can it be wrong for the leadership of the church, who too is just a group of humans having some form of control over another group of humans. Tithing is a form of coerced redistribution of wealth. The redistribution mechanism might be different, but it's a base the same thing. The Old Testament had a specific reason for this. Israel of old was a theocracy. We do not live in a theocracy. And that prefigured the coming rule of Christ over all nations, something that we will have in the future. That is not where we are today. Governments today do not represent the rule of Christ. Scripture tells us they are appointed by God. However, that appointment is not an endorsement. It can be, but it is of not certainly not necessarily so. God appoints for his purposes, and at times the purposes of God are judgment. We are living under very flawed forms of government run by sinful people who seek to control other sinful people. That much should be really clear for a Christian who has a basic knowledge of the Bible. Some good and does come from this, but it is undeniable to the true student of history that much evil comes from modern forms of government. Christians are citizens of another kingdom altogether. We are called to live peaceably, peaceably under our current forms of government, but under the proviso that our current forms of government act in morally correct ways.